Hello. So today's presentation is about a fairly important topic, and it's something that I've spoken about to a lot of attorneys in the past, and honestly, probably comes up on a daily basis. And because attorneys are always looking to make the decision of you know whether or not they're interested in going in house, and 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 I need to often talk to people about why that can be and may not necessarily be uh, a good idea for them. And so this is what this presentation is about. And what I will do is after uh, today's talk, I will also answer questions. And I know there may be a lot of questions about this particular webinar. And and as I answer the questions, hopefully everyone will uh, get a little bit better insight into this, this topic because it is an important uh, topic in, in a lot of respects because your career can be altered in a fairly major way by going in-house. And and it's just something that a lot of people, I don't think, always understand um, the, the direction. So I remember the first kind of introduction that I had to going in-house was when I was practicing law and I started noticing kind of all these goodbye attorney, goodbye parties for attorneys when they were leaving the firm. And I'm sure anybody that's worked in a law firm knows that you always there's always these departure memos going around and it can depend on uh, the size of the firm. But if an attorney was leaving to go to another law firm, typically go to the government or something, there, there was generally not a lot of people that would go to these going away parties. They were often, there just wasn't a lot to them and very few people would show up and sometimes there would be nothing at all and uh, people just wouldn't really say anything. But when people would go in house, I would always notice that there would there would be these kind of giant parties and part, partners who could be in the middle of a trial and they would show up at a party lunch and and people would, you know, be very nice and there would be these big, big things going on. And the attorney would be told how much they were respected, what good they what work they had done. People would bring gifts. And it's just, it, to me, I didn't understand what's going on, but I noticed the pattern uh, very early on that when someone was going in house, there was a much different reception than when they were simply uh, going to work in, a, in another law firm. And, and even during these events, partners would jockey for a position. They would, people were just very friendly. And, and, and it was funny. I just, I was remembering one of these particular parties and it was, a, it was an attorney that was very awkward and with glasses and lanky and walked with his head down. And, but I saw him and never looked so happy in his life at this party. And, you know, and it was just, I, I remember that I still can see it in my mind, even though it was two decades ago. The, these lunches were just unlike anything uh, I'd ever seen. And they, they were something I look forward to and everyone just seemed so upbeat. And, and I didn't at the time really understand it. I just, and I, even what was going on back then didn't even occur to me why it was like that until years later when I started understanding the legal profession better when I wasn't even practicing. But, you know, what these celebrations really were about is I think they're more like funerals in many respects, because when an attorney goes in house, a lot of things happen that they don't expect. There's this kind of belief that your life is going to suddenly be better. You're going to have fewer billable hours. You're going to have uh, a much more easier job. And in reality, there's just a lot of, it's not necessarily what it seems like it's cracked up to be. And I'm going to talk about that today. And I'm going to talk about why uh, that myth kind of perpetuates itself and and what I've seen happen to attorneys go in-house. Because for the most part, and I'll just say this right up front, when I see attorneys go in-house, they they will have suddenly all these periods of unemployment and all these issues and job to job. And often the first in-house job, they don't last very long. It's just, it's, a, it's not good. It's a completely different job than working in a law firm. And I'm going to talk about that today. And in, in many cases, these celebrations, you could be, you know, could be akin to funerals because once you leave a law firm, you're leaving behind an entire way of business and something that anyone can really succeed at. Now, I like the book, The Hunger Games and the movie and What's fun when the, these tributes are going off uh, to fight where they're most likely to die. They're often given wonderful food and treatment, and then they go off to a fight where almost everyone ends up losing. And, but during that time, they're treated very well, and they're put in a position where they're treated better than anybody may ever have been, than they've ever been in their lives. And, and for the most part, up until that time, they've been forced to leave them, live in bleak, depressing circumstances. And so for one moment in time, people are very nice to them. They make them feel important. And that's almost like what the, the celebration when an attorney is getting ready uh, to go in-house is like. 
And the thing is, inside of a law firm, nothing really is ever as it seems. The parties and these myths and so forth are really one of the most dangerous romanticized things that I've seen ever in the legal profession, because going in-house most often, in my opinion, is, is just a major curricular. I've seen it destroy the careers, lives, and families of more attorneys than I can count. I speak to attorneys that made the mistake of going in-house at least once a week. Many times they have gotten up and they've moved from a major city to another city and sometimes a small city and very quickly they lose their jobs. And I'm going to talk to you about that, why that happens. But then they can't find another job. Law firms won't hire them. In many cases, they may have spent two or three years trying to find an in-house job. So you can imagine it's even harder to find an in-house job when you're in a position where you don't have a job. And, and I speak to people but not every day at this point, but at least weekly. And it's depressing. I, I certainly see resumes of people like this weekly. But I want to first just let you know some facts that kind of perpetuate the myth of that going in-house is a good thing. And I just want you to be aware of them. But the first thing is, who wouldn't want to go in-house after seeing you know, one of these kind of giant presentations for a departing tribute? And never in your life will an attorney be career lauded and made to feel so good um, about themselves ever again. I'm in the, uh, I used to travel a lot and I would often see when, when a, a pilot retires, their last flight, typically they'll park a fire truck out in front of the, the plane and they will spray water over the, the plane as the, the plane, the pilot drives in. And, and that's really the extent of the celebration that someone gets for 30 or 40 years of flying. At the same time, when you go in house, the attorney really, we're well, just one second, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so yeah, but the idea is that the, the 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 attorneys are made to feel very good. It looks like a very happy thing, and people are made to feel almost like they're heroes in the eyes of their superiors and other attorneys when they leave. And so it looks like a very good thing. But the the truth is, and this is something um, that's important to understand, is that one of the reasons attorneys and others are made to feel good about themselves. Uh, and, and they make you feel good about yourselves when this happens is because these attorneys represent potential business. And that's just a fact. Law firms need business and attorneys need business. And you may find mentors and stuff inside of a law firm. From a business standpoint, partners are, are most concerned and their whole survival inside of law firms depends upon um, getting business. And suddenly treating an attorney that goes in-house very well is someone that's likely to give them business in the future. And that's the reason they don't really show up at people that are going to other law firms or going to work for the government. Typically, they don't care. But if attorneys going in-house, they do. And keep in mind that every working in a law firm and the legal profession, and especially in law firms, is a game. And anybody that can help you get business inside of a law firm is someone that, or that's outside of a law firm, that attorneys need to be nice to. Attorneys join organizations, they give talks, they write papers, they do all sorts of things in order to get business. And what better way to get business than from someone that you worked with in the past? And this is just the way the profession has always worked. Good law firm attorneys and good attorneys go out of the way. They meet people, they try to ingratiate themselves, and they do whatever they can uh, to ingratiate themselves and with people that are likely to give them business. And that's just how it works and how it's always worked. The next thing is the reason that people don't want to go in-house is because um, of the hours in a law firm and often the way that attorneys are treated inside of law firms. And the idea for every attorney that they learn very early on is if you're unhappy in one environment, meaning in a law firm where you're working all the time, then it's very easy for you to, or you can very easily go into a, I'm sorry, just one more second. We're having all these technical problems this morning. It's just not good. Let me see here. I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. But if I'm just one second, apologize. All right. Sorry, guys. This is the last, I promise that's the last uh, interruption. Okay. But if you're, the idea is that if you're unhappy and unworked, you know, you in one environment, overworked, if you go into a different environment, everything uh, is much, can be much better. And and if you go into a different environment, your life is going to change. And many people believe that the problem with practicing law is the environment they're in. They believe that that all they need to do to be happy is change the practice setting. And it's that easy. And, and if you do that, you're going to have a happy legal career. And people will always say when they do something else, too, if you talk to people that go in-house, they'll always say, oh, I'm so much happier. This is so much better and so forth. And that's just... Not always the case. If you ever talk to 
one of your exes, they're probably always going to tell you that they're much happier in a new relationship and so forth than they may be now. And, and that's just, and, and people aren't always honest about this stuff. So this is just something to keep in mind. And the fact that is that becoming an in-house counsel is not really something that always makes people happy. And in, in most cases, not in all, but in most cases, going in-house can actually destroy your career. And I've seen it more often than I can even imagine. I, one of my mentors, a very good attorney, one of the top attorneys, I think, in this practice area in the country, went in-house not too long ago. And after an exceptionally good career with a law firm, ended up losing his job and, and then getting sued for malpractice and having all sorts of problems. And this is a very well nationally known attorney. And this kind of thing happens all the time. People just have very bad experiences quite often. And I'm going to talk to you about all the reasons, but here are a few of the reasons I think that, you know, that are, are really the, the most negative about going in-house and why it's such a problem. The first thing is that you're going to, your skills are going to deteriorate very rapidly, significantly. In-house attorneys tend not to do the most important work. They do not want to be liable for making mistakes, and they will learn very quickly that it's better for them to send work outside to law firms than it is for them to do it themselves, and they will become experts in doing that and, and sending work to law firms and not done by That just becomes something that they do, and they become experts actually not doing work and having other people do the work. It's just what happens. And so your skills typically will deteriorate rapidly and significantly, and because you become an expert, and giving work to other people and not doing it yourself, you develop an attitude that the law firms want to avoid. Law firms don't want to hire people like that. Law firms want to hire people that are going to grunt it out and do the work and bring in clients. And then when you're in-house, you just don't get those skills. Another thing, uh, and each of these I'm going to talk more in depth about, but you'll also become a cost center. And um, what that means is the companies are will pay you money. And, and unlike a law firm, where, you know, if you work one hour and they, they pay you a certain amount or if you work, but they're billing you out at three, four times what they're paying you in a law, in a company, that's not necessarily happening. And, and so when companies slow down and they all do, they look at ways to eliminate people that aren't generating money and attorneys that are in-house are typically some of the first people to go. Uh, they think we can put off some of this work that they're doing for a while and so forth. And then the other thing is it becomes very difficult to get a job in a law firm in the future. Very few in-house attorneys are ever transitioned back into law firms. Now, certainly they do in some practice areas and in some cases, but it's very rare. Law firms will avoid in-house attorneys almost like the play. They just really don't want anything to do with them. And I, and I say this as someone that's consistently always trying to place in-house attorneys, and I do succeed at it, but it's very difficult. And unless you have very rare skills or something, it can be very hard to get a job in-house in a law firm when you're coming from in-house. Another thing is law firms typically, our companies want to hire younger attorneys for the best in-house counsel jobs. They know that their skills are fresher. They know that once someone gets more senior inside of a company, they become experts in giving work to other people and not doing that themselves. They want people that are more impressionable like law firms. Just like law firms prefer younger attorneys, most in-house companies do as well. And when you, companies are looking for attorneys, they typically are, are always most interested in in-house attorneys. It's very difficult once you're, you have an in-house job to get another one many times as you get more senior. The other important point that I'm going to talk more about today, too, is that when you're in-house, you really do not have a client clients of your own. And without clients, you don't really have any control over your career. So <laughs> what that means is attorneys, as they get more senior inside of law firms, are expected to get clients. and once you get clients, those people are giving you work and the law firm is providing support. And that's just the way the business model has worked inside of law firms as long as there have been law firms. And unfortunately, uh, when you go in-house, you don't really have clients and you don't have any control over your career. And the other thing that happens to a lot of in-house attorneys, and I see this all the time, attorneys in different parts of the country, is People, companies experience legal problem. A company like General Motors may be sued for a recall or something, or people may get injured, or a company in one industry may have issues and so forth, or a company may be accused of fraud and so forth. And so the problem is if you're an attorney inside of a legal department, when these things occur, and they all they occur in all companies, then if you're anybody that's believed to have touched the matter, you're likely to lose your job and you often become unemployable at other companies as well. Just because you were there when something bad happened that you may not even have had 
uh, any experience doing. Another thing that attorneys don't often understand when they go in-house is the job of an in-house attorney is much different than in a law firm. In, in an in-house attorney, when an a, a attorney goes in-house, they often believe that their job is to find problems and things that the company is doing wrong. Like they may want to make sure that the company is registered properly with a state and they're in different cities and doing things in the correct way. And, and people do not want to hear that inside of companies many times. The, the attorneys can become people that are telling management things that can't be done. They're telling them business actions they can't take, emails they can't send, different things that can't happen. And because of that, they become what I call the resident buzzkills. And these attorneys are more concerned about covering their backs than by telling management how they can get things done. And they become disliked in many companies. Most executives and senior executives in, inside of companies want in-house counsel who are going to help them get things done and help them kind of work in the gray areas in order to make money. And, and people that don't help them do that are typically people that they don't want. So just imagine, for example, if when a company like Uber was started, that they had in-house counsel that were telling them it's impossible to run Uber unless you make everybody an employee and not an independent contractor who's a driver and did nothing but talk about that. Those people would not be welcome because it would make it impossible for the company to expand. And yet that's the job of many people that go in-house is to do those sorts of things. So I'm going to talk more about all this later because it's very important. But just keep in mind, when you go in-house, the, the fantasy that a lot of attorneys have is suddenly someone's going to want your legal advice and so forth and be very excited for it. But the opposite actually often occurs. They don't want the legal advice of the in-house attorney and they become avoided. And unless you're helping the management of the company expand and, and do the things they want, the, the, they're not really going to be that interested in, in your advice many times, even though you may be trying to cover for them. They want people that will help them get things done. And that's a much different job uh, than many attorneys have inside of law firms. So inside of law firms, attorneys are constantly talking about why they want to go in-house. Everybody's talking about why this is such a big dream and, and why it's such a great thing. And, and I hear this all the time. It's almost the better the firm, the, the more people are talking about going in-house. <laughs> and it doesn't matter many times what firm the attorneys at. They could be at some of the best firms in the country, like Wachtell or Davis Polk. They all seem to dream about going in-house. I've seen people that are partners making actually more than 450000 making over a million dollars a year that, that want to go in-house. Uh, they could be attorneys that are the absolute top of their game, that have are very well respected. I've spoken with attorneys that have $3 million or even 10 or $15 million in business. I've spoken with attorneys at all levels with, with all types of business that want to go in house. And it doesn't matter who these attorneys are. Almost regardless of these attorneys' qualifications, they somehow think that going in-house is something that's going to change their lives and careers from the better. And I think the reason for this is the entire culture of the law firm and the people in it are always promoting and saying how great this is. Partners do it with associates. Associates do it with other associates. Partners often do it with partner. And, and most people just pick up the, the, their surroundings and they become like the people around them and they believe the things that people around them are telling them. And if people with great qualifications are saying how great going in-house is, then other people start to believe it and the reasons for it. But the thing is, the people that are really talking about it, that have a lot of power inside of law firms and are really talking about it, not because they actually want to go in-house, but because they figured something out. If they go in-house, many times that means that there's going to be a lot less competition for them, meaning there's going to be less competition for work. There's going to be less competition for clients. And many times other partners will encourage other partners to go in-house because they may want those partners' clients or they may want a bigger share of the profits that person is taking. And so no one inside of a law firm is really ever going to tell you that going in-house is a bad idea because the smart people inside of law firms that are playing that game realize that it's a very good decision for them to, for you to go in-house. They want to get rid of competition and everybody's always trying to push out competition. Associates are trying to push out competition. Partners are trying to push out other competition. And they also like you when you go in-house because if you're their friend, you may give them work. And smart attorneys really that know what they're doing encourage other attorneys to go in-house. And if anyone is telling you that's a good idea, 
you really should smile and get the hell away from these people because I'm telling you, this whole idea is very dangerous. And it's dangerous. And I'm telling you why it's dangerous because of where I sit. And I talk to people all day. I've been doing it for 20 years. I watch the decisions people make. I'm actually more interested in this profession from a kind of a psychological, sociological standpoint than I am from a like a, someone that's just trying to earn money and that sort of thing. I'm actually very interested in the decisions people make and why they make them and how to make good decisions. And I believe that is really something that just being on this webinar and after the this crash and stuff just now is very smart of you because you're learning a lot. And you may wonder why I have such negative opinions about going in house. And the thing is, I make my living place in attorneys. And I'm not saying that going in house is a bad idea, <coughs> excuse me, for every attorney. I don't think it is. But I believe that for most attorneys, it's a horrible idea. And it, I've seen it destroy countless careers or prevent people from going as far as they can in their career that should be going far. And, and many people go in house because of a lot of you know, misinformation. I remember there's just a lot of misinformation. I remember when I was in a, I was in a public school when I was younger and the, 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 there was no information about how you should go to law school or you should go be a doctor. The, the dream career of a lot of people I grew up with was things like, honestly, like you could be a postman and you'd make this much money. And back then it sounded like a lot of money or you could be a fireman or you could, or you could work in a factory. And everyone, when I was I remember when I was 17 or 18 years old, back then there were people that were my age working in factories, making the equivalent of probably $60, $70 an hour in, in today's money. You could really make a lot of money working in an auto factory. So if you had a right union job. So it's just, these are the things that people from different environments, and back then it was, I think, $35 an hour, which still seemed incredible. So it's probably twice now. But the thing is, there's always disinformation out there and different environments will give you uh, different types of misinformation and you need to be careful. And just to understand what it's like working for an attorney for clients that pay you for your services, this has been around for thousands of years. There were in Pompeii, I was just watching a show the other day and they were showing the house of an attorney that, you know, when Pompeii exploded in 40 AD or whatever, in Italy, attorneys have been around for thousands of years. And there was a house they just found recently and under the ashes. And, but the thing is, attorneys representing people and getting clients has been around for thousands of years. It was around in Pompeii. It was around before then. It was around before the time of Christ. And it's just always been around. And, and it's just something that is there. And, and the only thing that's really changed is that, that there's more of a kind of a commodity in the legal profession. There's large industrial law firms. Uh, there's hundreds of law schools. There's a pretty low barrier of entry to being an attorney. In certain states like California and so forth, you don't even need to go to law school to be an attorney. You know, associates and partners have become kind of commodities and they've been they're advanced and valued essentially by the hours they work and how much business they have. There's other factors as well, too. Uh, they're hired by based on other factors, but that's the majority of it. And what happened, and it's important for everyone to understand, is after World War II, the rest of the world was rebuilding itself. And, and so what law firms in, in, in the United States began to do is they began to mirror the way corporations operated, and they grew. They became very large, whereas before they had been fairly small. And as this happened, law firms began to mirror companies and, and depersonalize their attorneys just as uh, companies began to grow and have different departments and different titles and so forth. Law firms began to do the same thing. And the Cravath actually was the first law firm to come up with this idea. But what they would do is they would hire the highest performing attorneys out of the best law schools. They would pay them the most money. And then after a certain number of years, they couldn't make everybody partner because they didn't want to share in the profits. They would send them to work inside of their clients. And then they would have people inside the, the corporations that would always be their allies and that they would have a good working relationship with and they could always send work to. And prior to this time, it was actually very rare for an attorney to join, to ever work in more than one law firm, for an associate ever to leave, much less to go to work for an, inside of a corporation. So that's kind of how the whole process has developed. It started off with a firm called Cravath, Swain & Moore. And, and then it spread to other firms. Cravath is still the leader. If you always notice when they raise their salaries, everybody else follows. And so they're the ones that started this whole idea of paying associates a lot of money and then sending them to work with their clients. And that's just something 
they all did. And, and then, and so they had to create the idea that working in-house was good. And, and other law firms picked up on that and modeled their way of doing business. And that's just what's happened because hardly anybody ends up making partner inside of the largest law firms and they want them to go in-house and be their allies. And as associates and others began to participate in this assembly line, which means you're hired, you're worked very hard, you're trained, and then you're expected to go in-house and help the law firm continually get business and so forth. It just became something that was perpetuated by law firm management and others for the lowest performers. And lowest performer, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that you're bad. It just means that you're not someone that they believe is going to bring in a ton of business. Or the law firm may just not have room in its partnership or want uh, more people. And so they send those people into the companies. And regardless of how this is couched, it's always been a way for law firms to get rid of people without business, people they don't want, to make them allies and and then and leave people that they want to get future business. And no one ever tells attorneys this or that the law firm works this way, but that's really how the whole thing has been perpetuated. And it's to make room for better people who have what it takes and understand the whole idea of what it means to get business and so forth. Rather than hiring attorneys that are likely to bring in business, they can hire the smartest attorneys and they can work them very hard and, and then they can expect them to leave and be their allies. The idea that many people ask themselves when I bring this up is they may say, what does it take to be, what does it mean to be a really good attorney or what does it take? And, and the, the answer to being what it means to be a good attorney is very simple. And it's really very, it's, it's been, it's, it, what does it take to be a good attorney? It's been as long, it's been around as long as there have been attorneys. It's just, there's nothing has changed. If you think about it, like a hundred years ago, say you were practicing law in a small New England town of maybe 10,000 people, which I guess back then would not have been necessarily that small. The odds are very good that you would have been a solo practitioner. There might've been a few other attorneys in your town that you were competing with to get work, but you would have been a solo practitioner. And the most successful attorney in town would probably be the attorney that engaged with the community. It was trusted by people. They would, they would be going to local events. They would show up at you know, city council meetings. They would take interest in different people in the community. They would, they would be seen as someone that really wants their clients to do well. And they would be seen as the ones that really benefited their clients the most and were the most enthusiastic. And they would charge the best rates and be respective and just be thought of someone that cared about their clients. And that's about it. They might write articles in the local newspaper. They might give talks and do other things, but that's really it. And would show up at local funerals, probably. They would send Christmas cards. They would go to weddings. And generally, that's about it. These are the kind of things. They would just be people that were out and about in the community and seen. And being seen, by the way, is the most important thing an attorney can do to get business. Being locked up inside of a law firm and a giant skyscraper does not help that. In contrast, if you think about what the least successful attorney would have been doing 100 years ago, he would be in his office. He would expect work to come to him. He probably wouldn't care about his clients as much. He would think negatively of a lot of them. He wouldn't do necessarily thorough work. He might be more concerned about himself than his clients and how much he can charge people in the short term and play games. He'd be more interested in himself, his free time, and then trying to go to meet new people. He might be smart, but none of that would matter. He would not be trusted. He just wouldn't, you couldn't trust him and he wouldn't be out there and be seen. And he might be so careless, so little about practicing law that he might be happy to do something else or he could coach. So think about the contrast between what a successful attorney was then and what it is now. It's the same thing. So if you want to be a successful attorney, all you need to do is you need to be out there and be seen and get clients. And you need to be seen as an advocate for your clients and not for yourself and not play games and not, and this is it. And that's what law firms essentially want. And no one's going to tell you this, by the way. Law firms don't care if you want to just be a workhorse or you want to be someone that's out there in the community and being seen. They're not going to tell you this. These are things that attorneys need to pick up themselves. And I'm teaching you that right now. And if you do this, you're going to be very successful in a law firm. And you can do this at any point in your career. You don't need to just start out doing it, but that's really what it's about. Being a successful attorney has always been the same way. It was probably the exact same way in Pompeii, where they just found a house of a, a very successful attorney. It's the same. It's being seen, being trusted as an advocate for your clients, not for yourself, bonding with a variety of people. And just not doing that makes you unsuccessful. That's all you need to do. And that's what law firms are looking for. And these, this is the rule.
if you don't want to do these things, you don't want to be seen, you don't necessarily want to be an advocate, you don't want to bond with a variety of people, then maybe going in-house is a good option for you. But if you do these things and you really concentrate on them, you're going to do well. You know, as, but as law firms have become more larger and more successful, you just there's just different things that you need to do. And people that were good at practicing law like a long time ago were out there getting work. And and people did not use the billable hour. I've talked to attorneys that were even old when some, some of these, it's fun. I talked to people like in their 90s that were he's at Davis Polk when it was like a very old firm, a very young firm. And they would get together and say, this looks like about the stack of papers looks about this much. And they wouldn't even, they didn't even have billable hours. And different firms that, are, you know, have as they've evolved, have developed different ways, but but your ability to connect with people used to be really what would drive your success and your ability to show people that you do good work and to be out there in the community. And you know, long ago too, if you worked in a small law firm, it would likely have been with one other attorney, and and the two of you would have encouraged each other to have those kind of behaviors to be successful. And the thing is that the the problem with law firms and the reason people think about going in house so much now is that. The behaviors that make a really good attorney today are really things that are not emphasized. The billable hours emphasized instead of getting out there. So just directing money into the firm's coffers. They're built, valued more in their ability to do that than for the ability to bond with clients, get new clients and be seen. No one's going to tell you that you have to be out there being seen. I remember when I was, I was a second or third year attorney and I decided I wanted to get involved in the community and so forth. So I started teaching law school class and um, they didn't even know the firm I was at. They didn't even know how to, to deal with it. I, and I worked for a big New York firm then, and they'd never had a junior associate teaching a law school class. I thought it was good for my background and my pedigree for clients and so forth. And it did help me bring in clients, but people just didn't do that kind of thing. And everything is being de-emphasized to things that are important to the firm making money and not necessarily to your career. The presumption is in law firms that the cream will rise to the top, that the people that will generate and figure out how to generate business on their own, and that the law firm doesn't need to be involved in it. And it sounds depressing really, but that's how it is. Young attorneys, even senior attorneys without business are just billing machines and that's their role and they can be replaced. And, And the law firm needs people that can bill as many hours as possible. Unless you understand that dynamic, you're you're in trouble. And what happens is work dries up and work always dries up inside of law firms. And and it's always going to dry up, by the way, as you get more senior, because when you get it's closer to partner. And as you go partner, partners make more money work. They may get 40% of whatever they bill. And if some they're giving the work to someone 10%. So as the rates get higher, they're to do the and not only that, uh, but partners, clients prefer to have partners do the work if the partner is if instead of a senior associate and so forth. As your get, rates get more senior, you're typically going to be kicked to the firm, the curb, and and a younger attorney is going to need to come in and will do the work. And the process is just going to repeat itself. They want hungry people that are will take direction, that will work hard, and that sort of thing. And, and then the hope is that you'll go in-house. And this is just process just repeats itself over and over again. And it's just nothing, it's just what it is. And this is why going in-house is considered such a great thing, because you can look forward to it while you're sitting there, not actually improving yourself by getting more business and becoming what you need to be in order to be successful in a law firm. And you need to be able to see the forest and the trees. The only thing that matters for an attorney is having a book of business and getting a book of business and getting out there. And the longer you put this off and the longer, the more screwed up your career is going to be. It's like every day that you sit in a law firm and you're billing hours and not getting clients and so forth, is crazy because it's like not studying for the exam. The exam's going to come up eventually. It's like those, you know, nightmares where you get up and you haven't prepared for an exam. If you haven't prepared for the exam, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. This is preparing for the exam. And your responsibility uh, to yourself has never changed in the legal profession. This is the one um, constant that you need to be aware of. Your responsibility to your career is to get out there, meet people, make a name for yourself and get business. And once you have a stable book of clients, your law firm cannot, no one can do anything to you. Those clients are yours and 
Um, you can take them with you to other firms. You can set the compensation you want to be paid. You can set up your own firm. You have all sorts of options, but you need to get clients first. And honestly, if you have a large book of business as an attorney, you can generally work pretty much wherever you want and practically any firm. If your clients are big enough and you have a large enough billing rate, you can work just about any law firm in the country you want to. Honestly, I've seen people, you can go to a fourth tier law school and not do well there and build yourself up a large book of business. And you can work at one of the top 10 largest law firms in the world. It's possible. I see it all the time. I've seen people with multi-million dollar salaries that started off working in two or three person law firms and then just keep un understood the stuff I'm teaching you right now. It's that important. This is really important stuff. There's really no limit to what you can do. I know one guy, and I hate to bring it up because I hope he's not even watching, but he went to an unaccredited California law school, meaning that the law firm is so bad that the law school's not even allowed. The only place you can practice after going to this law school is in California. He's dyslexic, so he couldn't even read. He couldn't take the LSATs because he had to read backwards or whatever, which I mean, there's a lot of people with this disability. But the thing is, he just, he was motivated. He kept getting LLMs. After five or six LLMs, he, he got it from a, a good firm. And he understood this one rule that I'm telling you. So even though I don't think the guy's that smart, He's got all these learning disabilities, which make it even more difficult for them. He's got this huge book of business. He's, he doesn't, I, I don't think the guy knows what he's talking about half the time. I've listened to him, but he's, he's done very well. He does a phenomenal job meeting people. He's an adjunct professor at a top 15 law school. He gets out there and meets people and it's got a multi-million dollar book of business. It's incredible. And the fact is, even though I, I think a lot of what he, you know, I've listened to the guy giving me legal advice and is not even a practicing attorney. Like I can see through the, 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 the problems with a lot of stuff he says. And wow, but it doesn't matter. It's no matter. It doesn't matter. He's very successful because he's got business. This is what you need to understand. This is how it works. This is the game. All you need to do to be successful practicing law is get business. And attorneys go in house in droves and they, but all they need to do is get clients. The attorneys that are excited about other attorneys going in-house are the ones that understand this game. And the game has no connection. And once you go in-house, you've really stopped playing the game. Here's some of the things I brought up earlier, and I'm going to go through them real briefly with you and in a little more detail, just because I want to make sure you understand them and they are very important. When you go in-house, your skills typically are going to deteriorate. And then the most important work that is done by law firms and not you. Your skills will rapidly decline. Attorneys inside of law firms tend to be specialists, meaning you do one type of work and law firms will give you that type of work to do over and over again. And law firms will have people doing that type of work because it looks good to clients. And not only that, when you're working inside of a law firm, there's all sorts of checks and balances. So there's people reviewing your work. There's other attorneys offering you input. The law firms will, the partners that you're working for and others will tend to be on the cutting edge of things. They will talk to other people. Their, their skills are going to be checked all the time. New legal developments are quickly made aware to people and so forth. And uh, these are all incorporated in your skill set. And there, there's just a lot of emphasis on detail, not missing issues. And this is often way beyond the, the sort of uh, stuff that in-house attorneys receive. There's so much pressure to produce the best work for paying clients in a competitive environment, and clients can take their work elsewhere. So this increases the quality of work that law firm attorneys do. They don't want to make mistakes. They want to make, they want to present stuff to their clients that looks perfect. And there's all these checks and balances uh, that go into things. And the the thing that in-house attorneys quickly learn is that that instead of having to produce work at that level that it's much easier to give this work to outside counsel. Most in-house legal environments, the, the attorneys inside of the in-house legal environment become specialists in deflecting challenging and time-consuming work to people to do elsewhere. Attorneys that, that are in-house will brag about how they go home early and so forth, and they become experts in covering their ass in terms of handing the work out to other people. This is really what happens to most of them. And, and to make sure that other people do the work well. And they tend to hire the most expensive law firms and they tend to hire their friends and they hand, and, and, they, and, they, and, they, and that's just how it works. And, and their, their skills deteriorate because other people are catching things. And so as your skills continually deteriorate, and they're also, a lot of their days are spent being flattered by in-house, by outside counsel, by, and so forth. And, and, and as time goes by, they tend to get even lazier and 
clueless. Now, I'm not saying this happens to all in-house attorneys because it doesn't, but I'm talking about a pattern here that happens most of the time. And when I say most of the time, it could be, it just really depends. And the larger and the more competitive corporation and, and so forth, it may happen less than a smaller markets, but it's smaller corporations, but it does happen. And, and the thing that I've noticed is anytime I was working when I work with attorneys, I've always noticed that they, a lot of times will joke about outside counsel, about how little they know, their lack of knowledge and, and so forth, and, and their ability to make issues seem more complex to in-house counsel, to charge more money. And in a lot of cases, the in-house counsel sort of becomes the fool to the law firm lawyers, meaning the law firm lawyers are, are making fun of them behind their back. And I saw that repeatedly when I was practicing law, and it's unfortunate. And what's funny is anytime an in-house counsel sits down to do some semi-serious legal work, it could be writing a memo, marking up a brief or putting whatever, just doing anything. Law firm lawyers will always come out and say what a great job the in-house counsel has done. It must've been really hard work. Like it's brilliant. Thank you for catching this. And they'll always try to run it up the chain of command to make it look like this in-house counsel is doing an awesome job and really got the company's back and so forth. You just, I see this all the time. I've seen it in our, our company with any in-house counsel that we've ever had. It's very funny, but it's what happens. And then what happens is the in-house counsel reciprocate by sending the law firm more and more work. And, and this creates even more inefficiencies and ways for the company that the, the attorney presumably has been hired to protect and save money for. So it's just important to understand that when you go in-house, your skills become will deteriorate. And that's one of the reasons too, that law firms typically won't hire in-house counsel and back inside of law firms. And not only that, that companies often want to hire people that have the fresh legal skills out of law firms. The other thing that happens is when an attorney goes in-house, they often become a cost center. And what that means is they're often the first people uh, to be let go when the company experiences problems. And all companies experience problems, almost all of them. Sometimes the attorneys may be hired to come in and assist with a project that lasts several months to a few years. A company may be embroiled in very difficult litigation and bring on some litigators from a large law firm to save them a lot of money. They may be acquiring several companies in a space and, and want to get people with that expertise from a major firm to save it millions of dollars. Mergers and acquisition attorneys may need to hire some patent attorneys. So a lot of times companies will bring in attorneys on a short-term basis. And I speak with candidates all over the world seeking jobs. And when I speak with in-house attorneys, very often these attorneys have lost their job because the work has dried up or the company's ex just experiencing financial problems. And in every decent sized city in the United States, whether it's Chicago or Houston or Los Angeles or whatever, there's thousands of attorneys, their jobs and in, in from in-house companies that basically where the work is dried up or the company's experiencing financial problems. Keep in mind, in the law firm business model that I've talked to you about has been around for thousands of years. Companies, by the way, very few law firms go out of business. They certainly merge and things happen. When you're selling labor for essentially much more than a cost you provide, which a law firm is, it's just someone sitting at a desk and generating hundreds of dollars an hour or more, your costs aren't that bad. Companies go out of business all the time. The business model of a law firm is very simple. You bill hours and you collect money. Companies have to change business models. They have to do all sorts of things. So companies are going out of business all the time and they're laying people off all the time. And when that happens with a, a law firm, with a, with a company, the attorneys will lose their job. Companies will always try to save money by getting rid of people um, who cost them money and fail to generate money. Inside of a law firm, if an attorney's billing hours and generating enough to cover their salary, they're almost always safe and will lose their job unless the rules of seniority and so forth are, are violated. But especially if an attorney has business of their own, they're almost never going to lose their job or they can always take their clients elsewhere. One of the things that, that I see that's pretty funny is and I see this all the time, is in-house attorneys lose their jobs or they quit working in-house and they believe that, you know, that the company that they, or the, the law firm will send work their way, or the company will send work to them when they leave and they'll make even more money working on their own. And the, the, the thing is that almost rarely happens. The, the company typically almost never will send them work because they're regarded even by their own companies many times as second or third stringers. And, and the law firm always thinks of them most of the time as less competent 
than outside counsel. If an attorney is in-house and the law firm's paying them one thing, then uh, then the company's paying them one thing. And the, the, very rarely is the attorney going to get work if they go to work in a on their own in another law firm. It's just not going to happen. And the other thing is that most law firms will not hire in-house attorneys. They just, they're seen as gazelles that the lion was able to grab from the herd. And they're just not, it just doesn't work that way. And the same thing inside of the company. It's just, it's not something that, that they want. When a law firm, when a company hires an outside attorney, also they like the idea that they have a big name law firm behind them. And they take pride in that. And none of this is to be respectful of it, disrespectful in-house attorneys. It's just how it works. Most companies do not send work to in-house counsel when they leave. It's just, they're just not regarded as highly as attorneys from law firms. And there are some exceptions to that. Patent law is one of them sometimes and some kind of transactional disciplines. And so I'm not saying that happens all the time. It just happens a lot. The important thing to also understand is once an attorney leaves a law firm, they're almost always never going to get another job in a law firm. And, and not only that, but you're almost always going to lose your job inside of a company. So many attorneys that go in-house believe that they're going to be able to go back to a law firm because maybe because they think they went to a good school or they worked in a good law firm. But returning from in-house to a law firm is almost always impossible. And you have to understand why. The first thing is you've already proven that you're probably going to leave again that you may don't necessarily buy into the law firm model, which means getting business and doing good work and getting out there. And you've already left the game and shown your interest in not playing it. So you'll probably leave again. You've already had your going away party. And not only that, but there's there's a lot of other issues too. You just, anyway, your, your skills have deteriorated and more. In-house attorneys do return to law firms. So most often, as I said earlier, it's patent attorneys. Sometimes it's tax attorneys that have special types of skills that are rare, like maybe executive compensation and so forth. But corporate attorneys sometimes can go back. But even in the best economies, by the way, where corporate is completely just in demand and so forth, it's very rare. It's just very difficult because they know you're going to leave again. And why would they bring you back? Litigators almost never can. Arrest attorneys sometimes can, but it's just very difficult. Law firms typically will not welcome an in-house attorney back. And they've just, you've just shown you're not part of it and you're going to leave. They can't trust you to stay. And you can come back. It does happen. But generally, you're going to need to have something very special. You have to have a really good initial law firm that you've come from, really good grades, very good rec recommendations from your previous firm, maybe extenuating circumstances for reasons of going in-house. Like maybe you moved to a part of the country where the most sophisticated work in the small town you were in was with an in-house company and typically not much experience. These are really the reasons why. One of the biggest things that any law firm hiring someone is that they want to make sure that you're going to try that you can stay and do the job long term and you're not going to leave. And and they know that you're not going to commit if you've already left. And it's just it's difficult. The thing is that it, it just rarely works out. And and the attorneys, I don't know if pariah is the right word, but it, it's extremely difficult. I've seen many in-house counsel that have uh, been at major corporations and they've sent often tens of millions of dollars in work to various law firms and had very good relationships and with those firms. And their emails and texts and so forth would be returned instantly and they, they were being entertained and so forth by the law firm all the time and, and birthdays were remembered and so forth. And then and then when the attorneys leave, those same law firms go just completely cold and, and the law firms have no interest in hiring them or bringing them back at all, ever, very rarely. Now, I've seen some exceptions to that. I saw one exception at a very good firm, but then even that attorney came and was there for a year and then they asked them to find another job. So it's just that law firms look upon in-house attorneys in kind of a negative way and they, and the, when they leave and they try to get jobs over there, they just don't help them for the most part. And it's sad and I don't like it. And, but this is really what happens a lot of the time. And so the idea is that law firms, I don't think, respect in-house counsel as law firm attorneys because they don't really consider them part of the fraternity. They typically have a whole game they play where they make them, they butter them up. They make them, the work seem better than it can. They they think they know better than them and so forth. And 
and I hate to make this point because I don't like making it because I certainly like helping law and house attorneys, but I just want you to understand this dynamic and how you're going to be seen if that's something you want to do, if you even care, it doesn't necessarily matter, but this is really what happens a lot of the time. So the other thing um, that's important to understand too, is that most companies really want to hire young attorneys, most often from law firms that have fresher skills than an in-house attorney come from another company. Recently, I was representing a very good attorney that had about eight years of experience, incredible qualifications, and, and he was interested in a role where he didn't have to compete to be a partner in a law firm. And his attorney, his qualifications were awesome. He had graduated, I don't know if it was first in his classroom, Stanford Law School, but it was something close to that. He had an undergraduate degree, I think, at MIT, and I couldn't believe how awesome this guy was. And uh, But the, the law firm weren't interested in him. They just said, it's not going to work if he's not motivated to be a partner. We want people that are willing, that want to work with that. And it messes up our culture if there are people that don't care about this. I thought that was pretty interesting that they all said that. No one wanted this person because they didn't care about his qualifications. He, they just knew he wasn't motivated to be kind of part of their their. To, to do things the way. So it didn't matter these law schools, it didn't matter the firms he was at. So the things that, that the companies think is that companies think if an attorney is coming directly from a law firm, they feel like they're getting a, a great deal. So if they feel like they're paying the person $450 an hour at a big firm, and they may only need to pay them this much, such and such, at a law firm, they feel like they may be getting a better deal. And many smart companies know that the the ones that are smart know that if an attorney is coming directly from a law firm, they haven't learned this game of pushing work away externally, and they'll actually do the work and they can be managed and so forth, and they won't be covering their ass. I and mean, they're actually easier to manage when they're coming from a law firm many times than if they're coming from another company. Smart companies want efficiency and they want people that are going to do the work for the least amount of money. And, and the idea is if an attorney is coming from a law firm, the more likely to be hungry and more desirable. And these sorts of generalizations aren't always true, but for the most part, they are. And, and so almost always when a law firm has, an, when a company has an opening and companies approach you know, us all the time for, to fill openings and, and sometimes we fill them for them. And I've noticed that they almost always want people from law firms, not from other in-house jobs. And what happens is if when, law, when companies interview other attorneys from other companies, those attorneys will typically show up and act like they know what they need to do to run the in-house legal department. And they often seem jaded. They talk about preferred outside counsel and so forth. And, and they just, the law firms, the companies don't like that. And in contrast, attorneys coming from law firms will often be much more enthusiastic. They'll be manageable. The company can mold them into their culture and they want to impress people and so forth to try to get ahead. And, and all law firm and attorneys know that most likely as they get more senior, that it's going to be very difficult for them as well to get positions. And, and many times they'll say things like, I'll work for a second year associate salary because they realize how much they're making. And the, the thing is being manageable is more important. So it's the ability to work hard, to follow orders, trust the peers and a desire to advance that most law firms and companies are seeking. And they're really not interested in older attorneys that don't have that. And you have to remember that, that law firms and companies want those things. And when you get more senior and more jaded, they're just not as interested. And in addition, let me just see here. Yeah, they, they just don't have many times the drive the companies or law firms want. They want, they, they want the drive. They don't want people, you know, th without the drive. They want people that are enthusiastic and want to get ahead and aren't jaded. And again, the only solution to any of this that you need to remember is to to make sure that you do whatever it is you can to get business and give me one second i will be back just one second the other thing that's important to remember is that if you don't have any clients of your own you're really never going to have uh, any control over your career and i've seen so many attorneys that have just incredible records. And when I say things like having federal criminal charges brought against them, I saw one attorney that is now with a major law firm that was dealing with that for years for a financial crime. I've seen, you know, people spend not a year, but six months in rehab. And, you know, if you have this sort of thing, no one cares. You can still get a job in, in a major law firm. Not every law firm. Some are very concerned about their reputations and so forth, understandably, but this is really the name of the game. 
And, you know, law firms want attorneys with a lot of business and that know how to bring in clients and keep those clients. And that's really all there is to it. And I've seen things that just, you know, would, would blow your mind in terms of bad stuff in people's backgrounds, but attorneys don't care. I was in the Palm Springs Casino when I was a young practicing attorney, and, and I saw a very prominent attorney, and it's not someone I was working with at the time, but he was at a name partner, one of the best law firms in the country, and I just recognized him because I'd seen him before. And he was you know, gambling and drinking and drunk in the very early in the morning and sitting with two women, and not his wife, and barely understandable, and screaming loudly and so forth, and then and just having a really good time, and just behavior that would shock, and and at least did me. And But this guy has continued to do very well. I've seen him on the cover of all sorts of legal magazines, and he's one of the most famous attorneys in the country. So you can get away with a lot if you have a big book of business. No one cares. And, and it's really, I think, in many cases, the name of the game. And, and it's how people keep score. In one law, California law firm, I remember there was a partner um, that had a lot of business. I mean, he kept losing associates because he made them work so hard. And literally, this guy decided to give them an eight ball of cocaine every Monday morning so they would continue working hard throughout the week, which I think is just, this is unbelievable. But it actually happened. And um, each Monday, they would line up his door and it, like mechanical drones and shuffle with their heads down to receive a week's supply. And the law firm knew about it. Not only that, um, but the partners stopped losing associates and they started working even harder. And when the management found out, nothing happened. And the, the guy is still there. It's just, it's absolutely incredible. And it's very funny. This is a true story, by the way. And, and when I wrote this originally, I put in the name of the firm in the article for some reason. I don't know why I did. It was a mistake. And the firm called me. And I um, was very upset. And I said, but it's true. And I said, but I'm sorry, I'll take it out. And they were fine with it. So it was a mistake. I actually not, I think someone that worked for me asked me who the firm was. And I told them and then we, we had the article. But the, the idea is that having business is the entire name of the game. And if, you, if you're part of a business, you have a lot of control over your career. And so much, you can do pretty much whatever you want. You're complete control. The other thing is that when a company experiences legal problems, everybody in the legal department who touched the matter typically will lose their jobs. And all companies experience legal problems. Just about every company um, experiences legal problems at some time. They get sued in class actions. They, the government investigates them for something. There may be public policy changes. There may be sexual harassment or racism or who knows, but companies get in trouble for one thing or another. And anytime a serious legal matter comes up, the people that typically take the fall are the people in the legal department. And in the eyes of management, it's better to punish the legal department than take blame yourself. You just say your attorney screwed up. And this happens to in-house attorneys all over the country. And they lose their job just because they were at the company when something happened with a company. And, and it happens over and over and again, and it's just constantly happening. If you go to work in a company, the odds are very good that a company is going to have something happen. And the odds are also very good that something you may have been involved in will come back to haunt you. And when that does happen, you're often permanently tainted. You can't get hired by other companies. You're untouchable, not just by law firms because you're in-house, but also by other companies because of what happened when you were there. And you may often spend the rest of your careers as outcast for things and reasons you couldn't even prevent. So when you start to you know think about this Hunger Games stuff, you know, these parties for people going off to die sort of make sense because you could be a fall guy for a billion dollar company and the odds are very good that you may be. And in law firms, the worst thing that can often happen for an attorney with clients is to lose a client. If you have a bunch of clients, you may lose one and that's it. But in a company, you can literally be blamed for the entire collapse of the company due to some legal issue. And I talk to attorneys weekly that have lost jobs inside of companies and and really are having a very difficult time finding another job because something bad happened in their company. And, and if you go in-house, it's really many times only a matter of time before something happens. The larger the company, um, the better the odds that something will cross your desk and that you will miss, miss out on something that will end your careers. And the other thing, too, that's important to understand is inside of a company, there's also going to be pressure on you to, to, to be good at an in-house attorney. You need to make the management, you need to push things through that help the, the company generate business and money. And so in order to do that, many times you need to help the CEO and others bend the rules. And so anytime the company gets caught for bending the rules and all companies are caught for bending the rules, every company out there 
regardless of how esteemed the company may seem, has been in trouble with authorities and various people for betting the rules. And the thing is, the in-house counsel are typically the ones that take the fall for that. The other thing that is, is important, and, and this is something that I could talk about indefinitely, but most attorneys inside of companies are often considered the resident buzzkills that no one wants to do. And no one wants to be around, I'm sorry, because they tell management and people that are doing things what they can't do all the time. They become impediments for the company getting things done. They may not be liked you know, by people inside of the companies. And because they, if the attorney is doing their job, they're constantly telling people inside the company, you know, what they can't do. And so it, executives, sales teams, and so forth may often say they need to send things to legal before doing various things. And then when you're illegal, your job often becomes telling people that are trying to do things what they can't do and the risk with taking various actions. Then these same attorneys become avoidable and they become disliked and they become kind of scapegoats for the company not making money and having a hard time getting things done. And, and many attorneys um, that are in-house don't understand that their role is to figure out ways to get things done, but many times they don't. And so a lot of times they're often seen as holding back growth and, and that can make, put them in a negative light and then people want to get rid of them. And, and companies are under pressure from stockholders and people inside the company to make financial goals and so forth. And so attorneys oftentimes are very unpopular. If the attorney misses things, uh, the company and doesn't stick up for their position, the company will, the, the attorney may lose their job. If the attorney, attorney finds fault for things, makes things, getting things done for the company too difficult, she's not going to, she or he will not be like my management. It may be independent to getting things done. Most often I, I see attorneys lose their jobs in, inside of companies all the time. I mean, especially ones that are going in to their, their the first in-house job. And many times they'll say things like the company was trying to cut corners or was unethical. And I, I saw one person that I know very well that was a partner in a major LA law firm. And this was a long time ago. This isn't the person I brought up initially was a mentor, but he went in house. And within his first couple of weeks there, he started telling management that he didn't think they could do certain things and they just fired him. And then he was without a job and couldn't get a job for a long time because he'd gone in house and made a big mistake and upset the company. So this is what ends up happening a lot of times. And so the idea is it's, it can be a very difficult political game being in house. There's often no one right way to do things. Attorneys don't want to be seen as responsible for things that are happening. In order to attempt to find balance, they often send work to outside counsel instead of doing it themselves. Their skills deteriorate. Then they become a messenger for real attorneys and they become like docile managers and are messengers. And so their skills, it just becomes a difficult time. Many times people ask me where attorneys be trained to play the game, to meet people, perform in the way law firms uh, operated before becoming industrialized and these big, big firms. And the only place that I've really seen the law for this kind of whole thing alive is in personal injury law. Here, there's no real billable hours and attorneys get out there and they make a name for themselves, put themselves on the back of buses and they get their card out there and commute the community. They have pencils and little balls made with their name on them and stuff. And, and you really see when you look at the websites of many of these, that these attorneys really are trying to be seen and make a name for themselves. Many times they're all standing together smiling. You don't see that many very often with law firms. Most law firms just show pictures of individual attorneys and because they're all like fighting with each other. But then personal injury attorneys are always many times like standing all together as a group. Many times they give talks and so forth. They, they often smile, look social. And many times they show them they're standing up and not just their faces. And these law firms don't bill by the hour and there's no one for them to impress really but the client. And the client could be anybody. It could be an individual. And, and those clients most often don't know about schools, grades, and other things. Um, what matters is the drive of the attorney and the personality. And they want to impress clients and show them who they are and so forth. And, and that's it. And this game still exists inside of the industrial law firm, which is your man, modern firm that bills by the hour and so forth. But most people have been blinded by the system that shows you, that makes you believe that you need to work inside of a corporation. And I make in-house places all the time. And I believe, you know, that there's lots of attorneys that should be working in-house. And, and I'm going to really be very clear about this. The type of attorney that should be working in-house many times is the attorney who shouldn't be an attorney. And I hate to say it that way, but there's many attorneys like that. So if you don't care about getting clients and impressing them, then maybe you should go in-house because 
that's not something you need to do in-house. If you're more interested in having other people do the work many times, maybe you should go in-house. If you don't care that your career could end instantly, and you are interested in maybe having it end without warning, you should go in-house. Uh, if you want to play politics and games with your time many times, meaning give work to other people and so forth, and maybe you should go in-house. You can Many times you don't have an idea of why you want to be an attorney. You should go in-house. And and if you want to have long stretches, potentially of unemployment, which happens to many attorneys, you should go in-house. And these are all valid reasons. But being an attorney in private practice, most of the time, is like having your own business. You get a law degree, you learn some skills, you bring clients, you start doing work on their behalf. The thing about a law degree is a law degree is a license to bring in business. It's a license to charge clients. Other people in your community, whether it's your dentist or a chiropractor or a doctor, they're all getting out there and getting work and, and putting ads in the paper and giving talks and doing little workshops and stuff. And you should be doing the same thing. They have to have per pleasing personalities. They have to have fair rates. They have to have a good reputation. And, and these people, like all these service providers have been doing this like attorneys for thousands of years. Many times, and I'm just bringing up, and I'm not picking on women, but I'm just saying many women think that they're going to have better lives and time to raise their families if they go in-house. I know lots of talented attorneys and women with huge books of business that are mothers working in major law firms. And I know if you're a woman and want time with your family, the best way of doing that really would be to, in my opinion, to, to develop clients and then have associates and others do the work for you. If you have that, you're going to have more control over your work. And then you might have in an in-house environment and your career and you know can continue to prosper. I just don't think it makes sense for a lot of people to go out to pasture when they're in their 20s. And if you're talented enough to get a job in a big law firm, then I think you know you should continue, you should try to continue doing that. I'm gonna conclude here real quick and then I will answer as many questions as everyone has. I apologize uh, for that we had those technical interruptions and so forth, but the, the big thing I want to bring up and I want to conclude with is you just need to understand that. Being an attorney is like running a business. You need clients to run a business. This is the game and the only means of control you're really going to have inside of your career, with your career. I rarely see attorneys in, inside of large law firms that really do everything they can to get business. Most would rather go in-house for whatever reason. I rarely see attorneys moving to smaller firms or different geographic locations where they know they could get business. Many times, if you move to a smaller geographic location, you can set up your firm there and and get business. Many people don't do that. I rarely see people becoming, doing everything they possibly can to become the most sought out experts in their practice area. They write things that are relevant to a niche of their practice area. They speak, they teach. Instead, they'd rather go in house and be generalist many times. So my belief is that if you really want to succeed at the practice of law, you need to learn not to give up your control and learn the rules of the game and play this game. Okay, so I'm going to take questions right now. I apologize uh, again for the for the interruptions that we had, and but I will take as many questions as anybody has, and I will start them right now. Let me see. So anybody has questions, and ask as many questions as you have. So, so the first question is: Do in-house attorneys need to know a lot about their company, how their company is run, or about business in general? Yeah, so an in-house attorney does need to know how their companies run. That the most important thing that I think with an in-house attorney, you do a good in-house attorney should understand everything there is about the company and then understand where the company could be subject to attack and where the company may have problems. And you do need to understand that. And then you also need to understand the business. So you need to understand what is the company trying to achieve and how can you help the the, the attorney how can you help the company achieve and get where it wants to go? What I think most in-house attorneys do wrong that they should do a better job with is I think they need to learn to be advocates for the company and their clients. And they need to learn how to not necessarily be people that are portrayed in the opposite perspective. So you need to put yourself you know, in the shoes of the company and the company needs someone who's going to be an advocate and look out for them. Whereas many times that may not be the attorney's ultimate uh, objective. They may, the attorney may be more off for themselves and so forth and have their own needs, but you need to be the advocate for the company and the management of the company specifically and what they're trying to do. Let's see. I have an interview in a couple of weeks with an in-house counsel at a mid-sized corporation with offices in my city. What questions should I be asking during my interview? That's a great question. Typically you want to ask, you know, the best questions to ask for in-house interviews are going to be, what do you need from me? 
What can I do to help you? What is most important about the job? So you want to, the questions you want to know is you want to know where the firm's coming from. And then you also want to know what have people done in the past that hasn't made, haven't made them work out. So many times there's different reasons in-house counsel don't work out. I've alluded to some of them here. One of the reasons that law firms don't, in-house counsel doesn't work out inside of a company is because the person may just be too hands off and they, they may not be doing enough work. They may, the legal bills for outside counsel may be too much and the, the, the company doesn't feel like the in-house counsel is doing enough work. That's one reason. Another reason is the management of the firm or the company doesn't feel supported by the in-house counsel person and they feel that there's more of an antagonistic relationship and uh, they feel that the in-house counsel is not finding solutions but only putting impediments up to getting work done. So you want to figure out if that's the reason. Another question would be, the big thing is really is trying to understand why the position exists. So does it exist because of things that have happened, people that have let go in the past, or does it exist because of a new need? If it exists because of a new need, it may be because the law firm or the company doesn't want to spend money in outside counsel. It wants to spend money and have the work done internally. So I've seen, I, I had an instant, interesting case a couple of years ago where I was working on this in-house search for a company. And, and I'd sent them all these people that were exceptional. Like one of them was a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, which is an amazing firm in New York. And in this particular firm company ended up hiring someone that was unemployed, that had been unemployed for six months, but really wanted the job. And uh, the reason they didn't like these other people, like including these partners is because they felt like those people would basically come in with an attitude and be not want to do the work themselves and so forth. And they were right. Sometimes the firm just wants people to do the work and not to give the work out. So those are some of the things, but you want to really get into the mind of what the company wants, what the people there want, what they need, and let them talk about that instead of talking about what you're looking for. So a lot of times, in, if you're working for a company, you need to be someone that can be managed and also will look out for the company. Some companies may just want you to work on one particular aspect of your job. Other companies may want you, meaning one aspect, they may want you to work, if you're an employment attorney, they may just want you to do an employment attorney, employment work. A smaller company may want you to do all their matters. You don't know. So you just need to figure out what the company's looking for specifically. But you should say, what do you want me to work on? What don't you want me to work on? What do you need help with? What what are the things that have uh, caused problems for people in the past? What are the things that people have done well in the past and so forth? And, and, and those are uh, some questions I believe that will be helpful. Okay, let's see. Hi, Harrison. Thanks for all the great information. I'm currently a 2L and always have my sights set on in-house position. I appreciate the insights you provide in the webinar, but I do have no desire to work in a law firm and still attend to pursue a career in-house. Do you know who's the best trainer class to prepare to go in-house? One of the things I would say about going in-house as well is the law firm, I don't know that going in-house is really the smartest thing you can do right out of law school. One of the reasons is because the training that a law firm provides typically is very good. Law firms are providing work to paying clients and they're required to do a certain a level of work in order to get paid. And so I think working in a law firm, there's nothing wrong. If you're coming out of law school at the age of 24, you're potentially entering a, a career where you could be practicing at the next 60 years. So at least having some uh, perspective of what it's like to work in a law firm is a good idea. I do think that law firms provide the absolute best training. And I don't know that there's certain classes or training that would be good for going in-house. Typically, people that go in-house will have a certain niche. So they may that may be related to the type of employer that they want to work with. A lot of times people may come out of a medical background and want to work for a healthcare company, or they may have a, a technical background and want to do patent related work or work for a technical company. But the best, the other thing I want you to understand too about going in-house is most general counsel of decent sized companies and so forth have been partners in law firms before they go in-house. Just going in-house right out of school is not going to necessarily develop your legal abilities because you're not going to really get high-level experience. And and making that decision with as a 2L is, is just not something I think is smart. I would be very careful about that. Even despite what I was saying, I don't know why you've been so sold on going in-house this really. But, and the other thing too, is people always talk negatively about the hours of law firms or the pressures or the, but not every firm's like that. Typically the larger the market and the larger the firm, 
the more unpleasant it's going to be because it's just, it's going to pay more. It's going to have higher expectations. You can always go to work in a smaller law firm, but I, I believe the training in a law firm provides is invaluable. And you also need to see things from the point of view of outside counsel, which would be the way a law firm thinks. That's why, you know, for, it's good for litigators to work for judges and so forth, because they can get a sense of how decisions are made. I'm just, I got a great exposure to the way the law works when I work for a federal judge, because I got to see how decisions were made and so forth. And that was very helpful. Okay. Harrison, thank you for the great webinar. I appreciate you coming back on after the power outage. I've been considering going house for the easiest hours, but I did not want to give up my big loss salary. Can you shed some light on in-house salaries and how they compare to major law firms? So there's different types of salaries uh, for in-house. Some types of corporate, you can actually make more money sometimes in-house than you can make inside of a law firm. There's people that make millions of dollars a year as a general counsel of major companies. The problem with many times with working in-house is that the salaries many times are lower. In, but if you have certain niche skills, meaning a lot of times people have niche skills in different types of finance, like fund formation attorneys, or they may have very niche skills in, in patent-related work, or they might have salaries, different types of work, you can actually do much better. One popular practice area right now is like data uh, what is data privacy. And so a lot of times data privacy attorneys can make more money working in a in a law firm, I mean, in-house and they can make it a law firm. It's not uncommon for data privacy attorneys to make more than $300,000 a year or even $350,000 a year at mid-sized companies these days. The salaries can be very good. The only question, issue that I would have in terms of salaries is, and you, you're seeing you want to go in-house because of the easier hours, is the you don't have to work in a big law firm. You don't have to work in a large market. Most attorneys, that, and this is something that I try to say as much as I possibly can. Every attorney that I ever knew that had started out their career, and not every attorney I've known, but the majority of attorneys I know that started their career or moved to a smaller market at some point in their career, meaning moved from New York to Rochester, or moved from you know, Rochester, New York, or moved from, I don't know, Washington, D.C. to Cincinnati or something. Everybody that goes to work in, and Cincinnati is actually not a small market, but everybody goes to work in smaller markets or, or started off their career in smaller markets is often still practicing in law firms because in a smaller market, you tend to be, it's easier many times to get clients. The relationships tend to be better. The There's less up and out and the hours aren't as bad. And they're more attorneys in, you know, Rochester, even the biggest firms many times are home by six. It's just, so even if you're making half of what you're making in New York City, by the time taxes and cost of living and stuff are taken out and the extra time you have them and you're in a much better place. So I always recommend looking at smaller markets rather than necessarily going in-house because you can still develop a very good market for yourself practicing law. I just think it's a very smart thing to do, and I really do recommend it. Okay, what careers can you recommend for lawyers who have not passed the bar? Is in-house the only option? Okay, that's a great question. So there's many states that where it's easier to pass the bar than in others. If you are in California, it can be very difficult to pass the bar, and it's just the way it is. And it requires a lot of study. Anybody can pass the bar in California, but you need to take the time to study. And, and, and it's just sometimes people don't have several weeks of dedicated study it takes to pass it. If you can't pass the bar in a certain state, another option is just to take it in an easier state. So you find whatever the easiest state is to take the bar and you just take it there and pass. There's states where it's very easy to pass the bar comparatively, where the pass rates are very high. So that's what I would recommend is study for four or five weeks and then just pass it. Once you pass the bar in that state, yes, you can work, I think, in any state. You can get admitted. In California, for example, you can work in-house and as an in-house attorney by having passed the bar in another state. And then after several years, you can also wave into other states. That's what I would recommend. I would recommend not giving up on the bar. I just wouldn't take it in the most difficult state if you are having a difficult time passing it. And I know certain people, I remember one time I was picking up a candidate of mine that I placed from the bar or taking her um, out for dinner or something after the night she took the bar exam because she was visiting from another state to the California bar exam. And, and we were sitting next to this guy and he said he was taking it for the eighth or 10th time or something. If you're having that much trouble passing the bar, I would just take it in another state that's a lot easier. People used to take the bar, for example, in Pennsylvania because it was a very easy bar and almost everyone passed it there. And then if they wanted to work like in Washington, D.C., for example, and then they would just wave in there. So it's up to you. From for seven years and went in-house, I lost my job within 12 months. I don't understand it. 
They said it was due to budgets, but I don't believe it. Do you think I was not covering my ass enough? Yeah. So what you're saying here is very common. Attorneys go in house and they lose their jobs all the time. Many times when they lose their jobs, they lose it because they're perceived as not protecting the company, which happens sometimes, not being on management side. So the management wants to feel, and the CEO and the other people there generally want to feel like you're going to help them accomplish what they need to do because they have certain um, goals. So most attorneys that lose their jobs in-house lose their jobs because they become seen as constraints and not people that help get things done. So an example would be years ago, 15 plus years ago, or maybe more, we used to send faxes out to law firms and it would basically be news about weekly news, about things that were going on and so forth. And one of our in-house attorney came and said, this is impossible. Like you can't send these out. If you do, you're going to be liable for this certain law, breaking a law for sending faxes or something. And, and that's fine. And he was right. There was a workaround and the workaround was something like they were our pre-existing clients and we had a relationship with them. And that wasn't actually illegal. If they were, these are the people we were sending them to us. So he made this huge stink and then got all these other people on the side and came in and talked to me and made this huge issue and said I had to stop it. And instead of telling me the solution, which was actually, you're not doing anything wrong because you're sending these to your existing clients and that's fine, which back then was a law. I don't know if it is anymore. Um, we certainly long since stopped it because it was a lot of work. We did it in an automated fashion, but that's how we're doing it now. So the point is you need to be an advocate for the company and you need to find solutions and not be seen as someone that is embarrassing the CEO or embarrassing the management. And that many times is why you lose your job. Another time you may lose your job just because your work isn't perceived as good or they don't have trust in your work or whatever. And using the thing about budgets is always good because what are you going to do? You're going to sue a company for not having enough money for paying to pay you. It's just, that could be it. And, and I don't think this whole cover your ass attitude, anytime I've seen people have that where they're writing everything down and they're, it's just, it tends to be, those are the kind of people that companies and law firms don't want. They want people that are on their side and you need to be seen as on the side of your employer. Okay. I've seen friends in house who've been promoted consistently and they seem well paid and happy. Is this an illusion? They're an MD working for a hedge fund. Yeah. You can have exceptionally good jobs working in house and hedge funds are one of them. If a hedge fund doing well, then everybody's happy. Sometimes the hedge fund may start losing money, in which case then, you know, the legal department and everything can, cl can close and go away. And so, yeah, people can do very well in house. I'm not saying that that it's bad uh, for everyone. I could make a similar presentation about why law firms are bad and, and the problems of law firms and why everyone's overworked and you're not going to make a partner and all these different things. I'm just telling you that for most people, in-house is bad. And in hedge funds tend to make an awful lot of money. There's a lot of billionaires and so forth that run hedge funds. And, and that can be a good place to work when the hedge fund's doing well. And there's a lot of in-house places where you can do very well and have a very good career. It just depends on your skill set, how the company is managed, how successful the company is. I've seen companies, for example, there's a, a pharmaceutical company I'm thinking of where I knew a couple of people that were working inside of the, that company and the company had a couple of um, patents on some drugs and everybody had been very happy there for years, but then the patents ran out and all these generics came in the market and the salaries um, of everyone started getting cut and the revenues went down and the stock suffered and they didn't have any drugs in the pipeline. And so all of a sudden everything changed and then they were very unhappy not at work. So it can depend on um, the company uh, you're working for. And so I think a lot of people are very happy. You just need to find um, the right atmosphere and the right company with the right business model. I talk to people in California all the time that have had Google as a client. And Google is a relatively young company. And and that they have, may have worked on Google five years ago, and now there's a completely different legal team. So it just depends. The question is, does your firm have in-house counsel? Do you have a poor view of them too? Yes, our firm does have in-house counsel. And no, I don't have a poor view of the in-house counsel. Of course not. And But what I am telling you, I'm telling you from the standpoint of someone that has worked with lots of in-house counsel, what the, the issue is. I don't have a poor view of in-house counsel at all. But what I am telling you is the problems of in-house counsel and why it becomes difficult necessarily to get a job after having been in-house counsel. Now, I'm in a very niche type of business. And so people that work in-house here 
I believe, have very good niche skills and can have a very good career. But at the same time, as a general career move for most people, I don't believe that going in-house is the right career move. It's the right move for certain people. And, and I try to encourage people to stay with a law firm game as long as you can. Now, and that doesn't mean that I certainly think poorly of in-house counsel. I don't. But I think that the, the risk for most attorneys is very large and the rules of the game are different. So the rules of the game in terms of what it takes to be successful working in-house and what it takes to be successful inside of a law firm are different. In a law firm, all you need to do is get business and you will be successful. That's it. If you get business, you will be fine. And if you're not successful in that law firm, you can always take your clients to another law firm. That's it. That's all you need to do. If you're in-house though, your success is going to be dependent on the company doing well, the company not getting into legal trouble, your ability to have multiple successions of management like you and trust you. Typically in I know partners inside of law firms that never deal with other partners. They give work to associates, but all they do is talk to their clients. They have no interaction with the firm other than getting their compensation once a year and a couple other things. That's just how it works for them. And But inside of a company, companies go through all sorts of management. So one of the things that's scary about companies too, this is, I, I, you know, I work in a closely held corporation where I'm the CEO and all this sort of thing. But in many, any small companies, many companies, they have a new CEO like every six months. And so if you're working for a new CEO every six months, like those CEOs typically want to bring in their own management. And, and when a, a CEO leaves, they want to bring in their own in-house counsel and, and they'll get, want to get rid of you or they have different working styles. And so you just need to understand what you're getting into and you need to be very careful. It's just, it's not easy. And, and that is just something to be aware of. Okay. Let's see. I have worked in-house and found that a lot of work is being kept in-house in order to reduce cost. Have you seen this or is it just my experience? Yes. Companies want to keep work in-house to reduce cost. They'd be crazy not to. A lot of litigation is done in-house many times. A lot of transactional documents like real estate is often done in-house. There's a lot of and patents are often done in-house. There's a lot of stuff the company should be doing in-house. As a general rule, depending on the type of work, I think the safest in-house jobs are often jobs where you can be a specialist, meaning you can do one type of contract or you can do different types of things. I don't think that the, 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 the safest jobs are necessarily where you're going to be a generalist or you're going to work. I just think they can be very um, dangerous. But yes, I think that lots of work is done in-house many times and law firms do that. Companies do that in order to reduce costs, as they should. There's a lot of work that simply does not make sense for companies to outsource to law firms. I, I just don't understand why they do it, especially work that is, is fairly routine. And there's a lot of work like that. Okay. Let's see. Thank you very much for having this. I've learned top-notch drafting and prosecution skills, but the market doesn't seem to require those skills nearly as much as before. There are probably our clients and work that do not require such skills, but they're mostly controlled by firms or partners that don't want such competition. How do I get the words out to show my skills to such clients? The first thing is I believe that any patent attorney can easily get a job. Every patent attorney that I've ever worked with, I, I, I pretty much for the most part is placeable. They're not all placeable, but almost everybody is if you're a patent attorney, especially not in biotech and hard sciences. But how do you get the client out? The best way to get clients typically is to do work at a fixed cost. That's how a lot of solo practitioners and so forth doing patent work get work. Most people that are getting work as patent attorneys are very good at contacting in-house counsel inside of companies about the work and the, the bills and then having some sort of fixed fee and then showing them some examples of things um, that they've done before. And, and that can be very effective. That's how I would recommend it. I, I think patent attorneys that, that get out there and have good relationships with companies and small companies and large companies can, can definitely get business. Uh, my advice to you would be to figure out a niche of what you do in terms of the type of patent work you like doing or want to do and then contact companies and so forth that have that type of that have that type of work. One example would be if you have experience doing patents on I'm just trying to think of oxygen machine, I don't know, machines that generate oxygen, then contact all the firms and companies that have anything to do with oxygen generation machines and uh, around the country and foreign ones that may be importing those into the US and tell them about your expertise and then get jobs out and get work that way. And then offer to do things 
at a, a fixed cost. You need to figure out what's called the USP, which is a sales ultimate sales proposition or unique selling proposition, and then sell people on what you're doing that way. Another question is some companies have pat large patent prosecution departments. How does that affect your analysis? Absolutely. So you can definitely go to work in large patent prosecution departments. And that's another, that it, it, it does affect my analysis because those types of jobs, I think do offer, definitely offer a measure of stability that you don't necessarily find in most in-house jobs. And that was one of the examples I gave of an exception. And there are lots of places. Kodak for years was a very good place to do that in, in uh, Rochester, New York. And there's all sorts of places uh, where you can do that. Okay, let's see. I am a second year law student at UVA with interest in working in California. I attended college in LA. Let's see here. And my wife is from Pasadena. Oh, okay. I searched for two opposition LA and had a few callbacks. So I was on hold of one firm in particular and finally had to accept another position after they told me they would not be able to make a decision in time. However, they did tell me they want to hear from me as a 3L. In the meantime, I have a summer associate position in Dallas, which is near my hometown. If I develop a practice specialty that is a man at the time of the move, such as corporate or labor and employment, working in the firm was one of the large working in a firm is one of the largest and most respected in Texas, or is it the top of perhaps less known outside of Texas be an obstacle to move not or move to California? No. The best practice areas to move laterally are not going to be something like labor and employment, because a lot of that will involve local Texas law. And the best practice area would probably be corporate. Anything to do with securities and capital markets or M&A is, is always good. So you would have to decide what practice area you wanted to be in. And any large firm is fine. The only thing that I would say is in terms of taking the bar exam, you're going to want to have the California bar. It's very difficult to move to California without the California bar because so, so many people, even from really good firms and so forth, fail it. You have to decide what what bar you want to take. The other thing you can always do too is you can search for positions in LA after your 2L summer. Let's see, two, and then and that's fine. So as a 3L, you can definitely start applying to firms as well if you have a good experience in Texas. My advice would be to do everything you possibly can to get an offer because that makes you uh, much more likable and uh, much more employable. And the best way to get an offer is typically going to be to just bill a ton of hours and be very open to criticism and so forth when you're doing the work. Let's see. Is there ever a good time to go in-house? Yes. I believe the best time to go in-house is many times after your partner or after you have clients. And when a, a client of yours that you trust and you have a very good relationship with wants you to go to work for them and offers you a, a very good position and you have a lot of faith in their particular business model. That to me is the best time. When you go in-house as a partner, typically you're much, you're better set up and uh, teed up to be as a, to do much better. So that would be to be a general counsel. So I always recommend trying to become a partner, at least a ju uh, junior partner before you go in-house. If you do want to go in-house, I think the best time, and if it really does become your goal and you just can't stand working in a law firm for whatever reason, I always recommend trying to get at least like four to five years of experience inside of a law firm because that experience will give you a lot of training and so forth to make you much more effective as an attorney later on. I have an offer from a hedge fund to work as a mid-level attorney. I also have an offer from a large firm to work as a junior attorney, as a returning from in-house. Which one would be the best option? That's a great question. It depends on a couple things. It depends on the hedge fund and also from the law firm, the, which one do you think is going to lead you to where you want to go would be my question. And what is most likely to happen to you if you join the law firm versus what is most likely to happen to you if you join the hedge fund? So I always like to ask what has happened to people that have come before me when I'm looking at different jobs. And, and so when you look at a job, you want to understand what type of what exactly has happened to the people that were hired and took the jobs before you. So it could turn out that the hedge fund would be an excellent place for you to work. And, and I would be crazy not to tell you to take that. It also depends if, if you feel like you have advocates there and people that will support you. Do you want to spend um, the next seven years as a junior attorney in an in-house wor working inside of a law firm? And do you see yourself becoming a partner? Ultimately, the career as a partner Working in a law firm, I believe, has more stability. If you look at the number of hedge funds that go out of business each year, how many have managed to consistently make money over time, it's very, very 
slim the number of that have consistently made money over time. And it's very large. The number have gone out of business, especially in the past couple of years. As the stock market's done well, very few um, hedge funds have outperformed it. So most of them have gone out of business. So you have to ask yourself what's going to be best for you. In general, the law firm business model does last longer. You can have a longer career there, but you do need to learn how to generate business. But at the same time, you also win in-house. And so why did you do that in the past would be my question. And you have to ask, would you be likely to do that again? And if you feel like you would, then maybe you just didn't need to take the in-house job. So I'm sorry to be circular about that answer, but that would be my recommendation. Okay. Let's see. I was laid off from a law firm position earlier this year and I'm searching for another job, law firm or in-house. During a previous Q&A, you discouraged taking contract temp work to fill an employment gap. But I think in last suggestion, you, you suggest a contract work. Can you please clarify? Okay. Anytime you're laid off from a law firm position, it shouldn't be that difficult to get jobs. So people get jobs in every economy. And, and the key to getting a job is just applying to a lot of places and applying to as many places as you possibly can, regardless of whether or not they have openings and you will get hired. We are making lots of placements right now, but we're making them mainly in not the largest firms and smaller to mid-sized firms because of the way the economy is. So I would just recommend applying to um, as many uh, places as you possibly can. The other thing is the problem with taking contract or temp work is that then you identify yourself as someone that's willing to do that type of work. And if you're willing to work for $25 or $35 an hour, I'm not saying that much money, but if you're willing to work for a much less amount of money, why would a law firm hire you if you're willing to do that? Your job as an attorney, by the way, and I'm going to say this to everyone on this call, is to represent yourself when you're doing a job search and if, or to find someone competent to represent you and to get a job. And you need to convince employers to hire you. The best attorneys are, should have that persuasive ability to represent themselves. Would you want an attorney representing you if you needed a job that was able to get you a job or one that wasn't going to fight hard for you? And you need to be stepping up and representing yourself. I discourage people from taking contract or temp work because I believe that anybody that wants to can get a job, whether it's with a small firm or a large firm or whatever, but you need to really step it up and, and get a position. You can certainly take a contract or temp job, but my advice would be to do as aggressive of a search as you can. <clears throat> Just in LA County alone, where I work, there's thousands of firms. I don't know what the number is, four or 5,000. There's plenty of places that have work. Just because one firm has laid you off, doesn't there's just always work out there. Do in-house counsel typically have a better work-life balance? Yes, they typically, they most often do have a better work-life balance. Most companies, the culture is such that people are going home at four or five, five or six and are not in there and a lot of holidays and so forth. And you do have a better work-life balance compared to a law firm. In a law firm, you're selling your hours and your time. In a company, you're selling something else. So yes, they typically have a much better work-life balance. Now, whether that's to say, if you have more employment security, or the work's more interesting, or the you're going to have more future is a different a different conversation. I find what I like, what I do for a living, I really enjoy. So my days just fly by. I don't even know where they went. But if you don't enjoy what you're doing for a living, and it's not as fun, then you may not have as good of a work-life balance. When you go to a startup you're passionate about, can that be explained as a legitimate career risk if it doesn't work out when you're looking to go back to a law firm? No, I don't think it is a legitimate career risk. I, people do this all the time. I place, I, I have people all the time that it literally happens, not as much anymore, but when the economy is booming and so forth, it, it tends to happen quite a bit. People will, friends will start businesses and things will get off the ground. You have to remember that probably 95% of all startups, more than that, fail, right? Maybe it's 98%. You certainly hear about the ones that you can see, but most of them fail. And so what happens many times when people join startups, they don't, attorneys are, are notorious for being bad business people and not understanding business. And, and so what happens a lot of times is they'll get interested in an idea or people will make promises and, and they'll, they'll join a startup and they believe that it's a legitimate career risk. The thing with startups and make sure you everyone understands this because the idea of joining a startup is this fantasy a lot of attorneys have. Companies have a different type of person working in them when they're a startup that's getting off the ground than when they're a startup that is actually doing business and getting established and one that becomes established. So typically there'll be all these different stages of growth. The type of person that a law firm start that a company starts uh, companies typically get rid of their entire management team that started the company when they start getting more significant funding or when they start becoming successful because the skills needed to 
be a startup attorney are going to be much different um, than the type of people that are going to be around later. So what happens to it, if, if you go to a startup, most of the time it's going to fail. A majority of the time you won't get paid. Another portion of the time at a startup, if it does succeed, if it's one of the one in 100 or 25, you know, 150 that succeeds, what's going to happen then is that professional management is going to be brought in. And the last thing they want to do is have someone that hasn't run and, and managed a group of kids before we're starting up a company. They'll bring in professional management, especially if they take in outside money. There's no venture capital firm or private equity firm that's allow that's not going to have a professional CFO or CEO and so forth and CFO in a company after it starts generating money and they've invested in it. They would be crazy to not too. You'll typically be gone very quickly. So attorneys that go in-house and so forth and take those sort of risks almost always do not do well. Sorry. What are some tips for securing clients? The big thing is that you just want to make sure that you do whatever you possibly can to be seen in the legal environment, in the legal market, and to get out there and to, to be seen as a solution to people's problems. I also recommend doing whatever you possibly can to to meet people and to 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 put material out into the market that's useful for people. This is an example that I'm doing today as webinars, putting material out to the market. Other stuff would be communicating with in-house counsel, joining groups, and then just being very passionate um, about your practice area. Right, just give me one second. Okay. There's just a lot of questions today getting through all these. And I'm glad everyone's asking so many questions. Can't see that. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So let's see here. I'm a current student at a top 10 law school. I often hear about in-house attorneys visiting the school and even peers how great going in-house is. One such attorney was even claiming that they could go back to their law firm whenever they wanted, even describing how they lost their past in-house job when their very well-known company went under. Why does this idealistic attitude about in-house jobs persist when it's so perilous as you convincingly describe? I think that the reason that attorneys are they give so much credence to the idea of going and that they can go back to law firms is basically because it, they want to feel that way. But a law firm can always decide if they're going to bring them back or not. And and it doesn't, and, and it's very rare that they go back. It does, certainly happens. But I, I think that the, the whole idea of the reason um, it makes it seem good is I remember when I was growing up, I, and I, I'd always be around. Anyway, the, I, I think I, I just remember my parents always, when I would describe certain people that were very successful or parents and other parents, they would always have some thing and they would say, yes, the person may be this, but this is why they're unhappy or this is why it's not good. And, and so I think everybody wants to justify and feel good about their decision. A law firm is a very competitive place and it's very difficult to get business. And it's very difficult to be an attorney practicing at a high level such that you're going to, you're able to stay in a major law firm. And I believe that romanticizing this whole idea of going in house makes failure seem attractive. And, and I don't know if it's failure, but it makes a decision and inability to succeed in an environment like the law firm, especially the large law firms, where it's stacked against you. Think about it. If you're in a major law firm and all you're doing being judges by the hours and all you're expected to do is work and, and you get bonuses and so forth, you're consistently not able to go out and get business. And then the kind of business you could get isn't the, it's very, you have to bring in big clients and so forth. So it's just a very difficult place where you don't have any guarantee of a future. So the only way to really feel good about what you're doing many times is to try to get a job in a law firm, get a job, job in house. And then that becomes the meaning of success when success is impossible. And then there's also something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means you look for things that support your decision and why it was good. Instead of talking about all the bad pe the problems people have had that have gone in house, you just think about the ones that are good and you hear about the ones that are good and confirm it. I think that's why there's this passion about it or, or why there's this idealistic attitude. I answered this question about career risk. Let's see here. Hi, Harrison. Thank you for your valuable insight. I've been working as a solo practitioner for more than a year post-grad, and it has been a negative experience for me, so I'm seeking a new job. I recently obtained a privacy certification, but have been unable to garner interest from law firms about privacy associate positions. What can I do to make myself more attractive to both law firms and companies? My advice would be, many times when you're working for a solo practitioner, you're only seeing things from their point of view. and so a lot of that's one of the reasons it tends to be a good idea to go into a, a law firm with more attorneys because you can gravitate towards them and, and work for them. I know of 
several law firms that I've worked in my career where if I had to work with one of the attorneys there on an ongoing basis, I would have gone crazy. So that's one of the reasons that I think working in a law firm can be effective because you can work with different types of people and learn different working, working styles and so forth. So I think that is very helpful. The privacy certification you received is, is a good idea and it does show your interest in something, but that's not the same as being trained in a law firm to do the type of work. So my advice would be to, if you're not happy working with a solo practitioner, we would do whatever you possibly can to get work and in terms of in the practice area you want or to go to a firm where you're going to be exposed to more people. Let's see here. Let's see. Why do you recommend to people already in-house run, hide, or just give up and wait for the inevitable? I, if you're already in house, I, I think that you have a lot of options. I think that the most important thing is to find the, the environment that's best for you. If you can go to, if you, my advice, if you're in house is to try to, first of all, to find a, a company that you have faith in. And there's certain companies where you theoretically could have a very long-term career, but you just don't know what type of industry is, tends to be recession proof. What type of industry isn't subject to <clears throat> constant innovation and, and what type of company is most likely to be safe or where are you going to get the, what, where are you going to get the, the exposure and so forth that you need? And, and so, you know, that, those are some issues that I would recommend and you just need to find the right environment. And if you're in the right environment in-house, then that can be very good. Now I gave you the example of the hedge fund, all these hedge funds going out of business. Is that the right environment? Probably not, but it might be if it's a really good hedge fund on a run, but you just never know. My advice is if you're in-house is to do what you possibly can to find the right place because you can have a long-term career. You can be at the same in-house job for your entire career, but you need to find the right environment. And that would be what I would recommend. And maybe you are in the right environment. Many times, the most logical advice, by the way, is to hit your wagon to a star. If you're with a CEO that, or you're with a company where you're with the founder, working with the founder of the company or so forth, or someone that's always going to need someone like you, then you could have a very good career working for them. And so the, the, as long as you're an advocate for the management of the company and you believe that they're going to have something for you or the owner of the company, you, you'll have some very, could have a very good future, but you just need to be careful about the environment you're in. You can't just take a job. And I, I don't like jobs where everything is cold and impersonal when you're being hired, because if that's the case, the same thing's going to happen when you lose your job. I like the kind of jobs where there's a long-term relationship and or where you, they feel a real sense of connection and where things are, there's a lot of good things going on. And, and I think those are really the best jobs if you can get those. And that's something I would recommend. Why do a lot of lawyers go into recruitment? Do you recommend it? I don't know. I went into it just because from my standpoint, I felt like it was a, a very good, it was a very good fit for my skills. Uh, I was actually interested in I, I had been, I, I had done really well in college and worked very hard to get into law school, like everyone else probably on this call. And, and when I started talking to people in the recruiting business, I was amazed that they knew nothing about what I did. They had no kind of persuasive skills to represent me effectively. They didn't have access to information and so forth. And so it really motivated me. And I thought, how could my career come down to an encounter with this you know, with this type of person, like that to me seems unfair. And, and so that's why I got very enthused about it because I put myself in the shoes of, of another attorney and I had sacrificed a lot. I worked extremely hard in college, extremely hard in law school, and I really wanted to be an attorney and it meant a lot to me. And I'd grown up and not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination in Detroit. And here I was, and, and, I, and these people were in charge of my career. So that's why I went into it. I think, do I recommend it? I, I do recommend it if you have the right motivations. I think a lot of people, most people that I know that do it aren't motivated by the right reasons that, for doing it. Many times they're motivated because they think they want to work as hard, or they want to make money and they think it's easy, or they, and it's not like anything It's that you, if you want to be good at anything, it's a lot of work. And then so I start my day at, you know, 6 a.m. and I don't. I work a 12, 13 hour day, but I love it. And most people don't. And, but if recruiting is, it's a different kind of profession. It's not, most attorneys would not be good at recruiting because it, it's very, you know, you have to be very interested in people and you have to be selfless and you can't, you can't necessarily take, and most people that go into it fail, not most, but depending on what, how the kind of atmosphere that they end up in, but I like it. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Would you say that being in house is better than being non-equity of counsel? The problem with the latter is they're always the first to go when there's a downturn. 
And there have been downturns in 1990, true, 2001, true, 2008, true, and 2020. Yes, I think non-equity and of counsel are very risky. I think if you're a non-equity of counsel, though, the benefit of being a non-equity of counsel is you can always learn these business generation skills. And if it was me and I was non-equity of counsel, I would just do, I would throw myself into getting business. I know lots of partners that have just these huge books of business. And I always question them, what did you do? And how did you do it? And they always just say the same thing, lots of wine and dinners and or something along those lines. It's just, it depends on the person and what they want to do, but you just need to learn how to get business. And it doesn't, getting business, by the way, doesn't mean you have to be outgoing. Some of the biggest nerds you can imagine are good at getting business. It doesn't mean you have to be, anything special. You just have to learn. You have to read about it. You have to study it. If it was me and I was an attorney, I would study everything I possibly could about getting business because I would know that it's the most important thing to my long-term success. And talk about in-house counsel. In-house counsel lose their jobs all the time. I mean, you could lose your in-house counsel job because the, the CEO's fired and then they bring in a new CEO. You don't know. There's so many reasons in-house counsel have problems. So I would just be extremely cautious about taking any type of job in-house, if you, especially if you're non-equity or of counsel. If you're non-equity of counsel, that means you do very good work and the firm would like to advance you. I Almost every in-house counsel that I, every non-equity partner or every out of counsel I know, the law firm always says to them at some point, if you prove your game, we'll make you partner. They want to, they like their work. And while they may let them go, those both of those titles are potential tracks to doing something much greater. So I would definitely work on that if, I, if it was me. Okay. I wanted to ask your feedback whether or not a patent prosecution is viable for me. I'm a 42-year-old non-traditional law student who spent 15 years doing microprocessor and circuit design work at a top se se semiconductor companies. I'm a master's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell and a bachelor's degree in both electrical engineering and biochemistry from UCSD. Wow. I've read that EE is a good background for patent prosecution, but I'm concerned about my lower ranked law school and age. <laughs> my questions are, what would make sense for me? Would it make sense for me to transfer to a higher ranked school? I would like to take, I would take on significantly more debt, but it would help my career. Would H-42 be an issue when it comes to OCI summer position associates with large law firms? Okay, so there's an article I've written called Why Law Firms Have No Idea How to Hire Patent Attorneys or something along those lines that I'd recommend uh, reviewing. And, but no, 42 is not too old to be a patent prosecution attorney by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, you should always transfer and go to the best law school you possibly can, as opposed to work going to a lower ranked law school. You should do whatever you can to go to the best law school. But one of the things I would tell you, and it, regardless of the debt, it just doesn't matter in the long run. It's just not going to be, it's low interest debt. It's not, there's, who knows? It might even be dischargeable under the new administration. I don't know. But the point is that it's not something that you should always go to the best law school because the big law firms tend to be law firm snobs, law school snobs. The big thing that I would recommend, though, that I think is very important for you to remember is if you go to a, a top law school or if you don't go to a top law school, most patent attorneys do not go to top law schools because they um, typically don't always do the best in the LSATs. And even if they do, because they have these engineering backgrounds, they don't always have the best grades. People that get the best grades and go to the best law schools typically major in political science and these sorts of things. And they don't get the best grades, which is perfectly fine. But the point is that most patent prosecution associates do not start out in big law firms. They start out in smaller law firms and then they're hired by big law firms later. That's what happens to almost all of them. Very few of them start out in big law firms. So your most important thing is to get the experience and to go to the best law school you can. And, and you will get experience. And 42 is not too old. You can practice as a patent attorney well into your 70s and having all your work experience is good. So I think you're perfectly fine. I would read the article that I talked to you about. I'm a European qualified lawyer and New York attorney. I've received two job offers. One, to work as a junior attorney at a top international law firm, which will train me in U.S. law, and I will be working with U.S. clients. Or to work as an in-house, mid-level senior attorney and working on uh, European law, which should I accept? Both positions will have similar pay. I think you should work in, a, in the law firm because I think that working in a law firm is going to give you better exposure. And, and I, I would do whatever I could to work in a law firm. The training is better in law firms. Everyone knows what the brand of working in a certain firm means, but they don't know what each company means. I would think about that. 
Okay. How do you rehabilitate in-house counsel to get them back to a law firm? The big thing that I recommend if you want to get back to a law firm is doing whatever you can to look like a specialist and just to keep applying to jobs. Typically, if you have experience in something related to corporate law or some sort of transactional discipline, many times you can get back to a law firm and it can be a, a smaller law firm, and, and but you definitely need to portray yourself as someone that really wants to work in a law firm and give the reasons why that I've given you in this presentation, which you feel like your skills will be better in a law firm. You want to get clients, you want to play the whole game. And if you can do that, it will you know, be much more effective. And so that's how I do it. But I typically, when I work with in-house counsel trying to get back to a law firm, the thing that I'm most concerned about is making them look like specialists. Because if you look like a specialist, you're more likely to get a job. And the other thing is trying to work in firms and locations where there's going to be, where there's not a lot of people like you. Trying to work in the biggest firms that have no problem attracting people, everything is about the law of supply and demand. So what that means in terms of supply and demand is it means that the biggest law firms are going to be able to attract people from other law firms. So why would they want to hire people from in-house? So you want to hire people that are going to have a hard time finding people like you, which tend to be smaller firms or firms in smaller markets is really the way I would go about it. Okay. I've been working for 15 years in a very specialized area of law. I'm usually hired for specific cases because they don't have staff that says credentials. Most of the time in boutiques and also major law firms, two to three years in each law firm. I still do not find a way to have a book of clients. Do you um, think going to house would be a good next step? Any other suggestion? Sorry, I'm just curious. Okay. I, I don't know. I think going in house as a litigator can be very difficult. My advice would be to try to find uh, a law firm that's going to have more ongoing type of work for what you're doing. I don't know where they're getting those clients from or how those firms are getting those clients. Another thing you may want to try to do is set up your own practice, doing that type of work, and then marketing to the types of law firms that have hired you in the past. That would be really what I would recommend or how I would worry, how I would probably go about trying to do that. I would look at where these cases are coming from, the type of cases they are, and then market myself to the type of people getting, sending those cases to law firms and maybe have my own practice. If you're uncomfortable with your own practice, I would probably continue doing what I'm doing or go to an in-house company that has those on an ongoing basis. Okay. Let's see. What about working for a government agency like an AG office? Have you had success placing government attorneys? I do not place government attorneys, but it can be a good idea. And if that's something you're interested in doing, but I don't place government attorneys. I, the government typically doesn't use people like me for you know, those types of jobs working as the general counsel for a government agency the same as private industry in-house work? No, I don't. I don't know. Different in-house, co different companies will have different types of in-house jobs. So different different government agencies may have different in-house jobs. So I don't really know about all those. My Most of my experience has been with people going in-house with private industry. What I do know about going in-house with the government that I think is actually a nice thing is those positions can be very safe. If they're not necessarily, if they're not administration-based, meaning Republicans versus Democrats, and then when one party goes in and out and so forth, they can actually be very safe. And you can have a lot of employment stability there that you might not necessarily have in the in-house because the government isn't as accountable to private industry. So I think that many times the government is a very good place. This is here. Do you offer one-off advice to job seekers who require specific advice in their particular circumstances, especially when they're not using your services? Happy to pay for your advice. What I would recommend is just coming back to these weekly webinars. I think that can be very helpful for you. And then the only other thing I would say, in addition to the weekly webinars, would be we do offer coaching, but I don't know. It's expensive, and I don't know that really... For most people, I don't know that it makes sense. And I think if you search for BCG coaching or something, I think there is some coaching um, that we do offer to people. But my advice would be to spend a lot of time on the BCG website, continue coming back to these. And then also at or.com, uh, there is a collection of all these webinars and they may be helpful. And I think learning this stuff is, is exceptionally smart. So let me see if there's any other questions. I know there was some Q&A here. There's some, no, I think I got it all. All right, I think that's it, everyone. Chat, the chat stuff. Okay. Thank you for everybody. And, and thanks. Sorry about all the issues that we had today, but I appreciate everyone coming. I'll have a nice Thanksgiving and I will talk to everyone next week. Thanks.